In our last video, we focused on London dispersion forces. In this video, we're going to look at several other types of intermolecular forces. And the first one I have for you here will be dipole-dipole forces. Now, in order to explain this, let's imagine a molecule of hydrogen chloride just, just floating around. So here we have HCl. And we know from what we've already learned about, about the molecular structure that this is going to be a lopsided structure. We know that chlorine is uh, very electronegative and hydrogen is not. So there is a lopsidedness to this molecule. So that means that this electronegative atom is going to have a partial negative charge. So that's, what, that's why there's a delta negative. And then I have a partial positive on the hydrogen side of this. So it's, it's delta positive. So we have a polar molecule, just like we learned about at the end of Unit 2. Now, if we have several of these molecules next to each other, and we have that same lopsidedness as we're going to have, well, guess what? There's going to be an attraction here. This positive right here is going to be attracted to the negative side of its neighbor. So there's going to be a fairly strong intermolecular force right there. And then likewise, we have a negative here, and it's going to attract the positive side of its neighbor. Once again, a fairly strong intermolecular force. This, These forces, that's called the dipole-dipole force. And dipole-dipole forces are only going to be found in polar molecules. And so in order to understand this or to, to solve these, you're going to have to be able to do a Lewis electron dot diagram like we learned at the end of Unit 2. So make sure that you can do that so you can determine if something is polar or a nonpolar structure. If something is a polar molecule, it's going to have dipole-dipole forces, but don't forget that it also has London dispersion forces. Everything has London dispersion forces, like I mentioned in the last video. Now, generally speaking, uh, everything else being equal, dipole-dipole forces are going to be stronger than London dispersion forces. So if you have similar numbers of electrons, that means that if you have a polar molecule, it's probably going to have a higher boiling point than a nonpolar molecule. And of course, there's a caveat there. Similar numbers of electrons. If you have something with a, a whole lot larger number of electrons in a nonpolar molecule, well, its LDFs might be, be stronger. But you know, everything else being equal, dipole-dipole uh, tends to be a little stronger than London dispersion. So which of these molecules has the higher boiling point? Can you look at this and figure it out? Well, we hopefully know that this butane molecule is a nonpolar structure. You know, most of these organic hydrocarbons are just nonpolar if it's just C and H, so that's just London dispersion forces. But if you draw out nitrogen trichloride, you'll see that this is a polar molecule. So it has LDFs, but also dipole-dipole forces. So we're going to say that this has the higher boiling point. And of course, this is confirmed by looking it up online in the chemical law literature. We find that the boiling point is a whole lot higher than it is for butane. And by the way, sometimes when we say dipole-dipole forces, it's given a boiling point. Can you look at this and figure it out? Well, we hopefully know that this butane molecule is a nonpolar structure. You know, most of these organic hydrocarbons are just nonpolar if it's just C and H, so that's just London dispersion forces. But if you draw out nitrogen trichloride, you'll see that this is a polar molecule. So it has LDFs, but also dipole-dipole forces. So we're going to say that this has the higher boiling point. And of course, this is confirmed by looking it up online in the chemical law literature. We find that the boiling point is a whole lot higher than it is for butane. And by the way, sometimes when we say dipole-dipole forces, it's given a slightly different name. Sometimes they say that if something has a dipole-dipole force, it has a dipole moment. And that's spelled just like it sounds. It's having or it has a dipole moment. 
which sounds kind of strange, but that's just the same thing. It means it's got dipole, dipole forces, or it is a polar molecule. Now, let's go on to another very important molecule, and that's water. This is a molecule that we've looked at many times in this course already, even though we're just in unit three. And we have water, and we know that oxygen is very electronegative, uh, and this is very lopsided. This is a bent structure. So this is going to be a very polar molecule. So we can draw the partial negative right here next to the oxygen and the partial positive next to the, the hydrogen end of that molecule. And if we have another water molecule, and of course probably lots and lots of water molecules around, I bet you can see what's happening here. We have a very strong force between the negative side of this molecule and the positive side of its neighbor. So there's a very strong intermolecular force in between those two molecules. And for all practical purposes, that's a dipole-dipole force, isn't it? That's what we just talked about. However, there's something special about this molecule, about water, and, and molecules that are a lot like it. The fact is, hydrogen is an extremely tiny atom. In fact, it is basically the tiniest atom that you could ever have in a molecule. It's as small as it gets as far as atoms that are in molecules. And because hydrogen is so small, it means that in a neighbor, in a, a neighboring water molecule, the oxygen can get extremely close to that molecule. And you know what? Oxygen is not only very electronegative, it's also a fairly tiny atom. It is one of the tiniest atoms, not as small as hydrogen, but it is very tiny, which allows other water molecules to get to, to scoot up very close to it. And because of that small distance between the molecules, that means that hydrogen bonding is very strong. That's why this is given a special name. This is basically Coulomb's law. The, the closer the distance between the molecules, the stronger the intermolecular attraction. And that's what we have here, basically an application of Coulomb's law. This intermolecular force is very strong. This is uh, a whole lot stronger than just your everyday run-of-the-mill dipole-dipole force. In a hydrogen bond, it, it's a dipole-dipole force, but it's, it's a very strong form of this. And it's only going to be found in molecules that contain uh, an oxygen-hydrogen bond, like you have in water, or a nitrogen-hydrogen bond, or a fluorine-hydrogen bond. So if you see one of those combinations, that's the tip-off that you're going to have a hydrogen bond in that molecule. Very, very strong force. Generally, these are a whole lot stronger than London dispersion forces or just your everyday run-of-the-mill dipole-dipole force. And this also helps us to explain why if you have a polar molecule that has fluorine, oxygen, or nitrogen in it, it's probably going to dissolve in water because molecules like this can hydrogen bond with water itself. Now, if we look at this example, hopefully we can look at that and determine which of those molecules will have hydrogen bonding. It's the one that's going to have one of those three bonds in it, and that would be NH3 because it has a nitrogen-hydrogen bond. The NO bond, no, that's not going to work because, of course, you have to have hydrogen in order to have a molecule with hydrogen bonding. So let's take a look at this question. Let's say that a chemistry student observes that ammonia, NH3, readily dissolves in water while PH3 gas does not. Explain this phenomenon in terms of intermolecular forces. Well, it has to do with the fact that we have a molecule here that can hydrogen bond with water, ammonia. And that happens because its nitrogen atom there in the center is both very small and also very electronegative. Whereas the pH3 molecule only has fairly weak attractions to water. It's not able to hydrogen bond to water because the phosphorus atom is, is somewhat larger and it's not nearly as electronegative as nitrogen is. And so hydrogen bonding can also help us to explain why some substances dissolve in water 
and others do not. Now, let's use what we've learned in this video and the last one to rank these compounds in order of increasing boiling point. Now, we know that London dispersion forces alone will be the weakest. So that would have the lowest boiling point. So the one that's nonpolar is carbon dioxide. So your nonpolar is the lowest. And then what's next? Well, London dispersion forces is lower. And then you'll have dipole dipole. So which one is just a normal run of the mill dipole dipole? Well, that would be nitrogen dioxide. It is a polar molecule. And so that's, that's in the middle. And then hydrogen bonding is the highest of the three that we've learned so far. And that would have to be water, because water has hydrogen bonding. And so there's your, your ranking. And if we, once again, look up the boiling points online or in the chemical literature, we can see that our predictions are absolutely correct. The, the one with just London dispersion forces, very low. The one that's uh, got dipole-dipole uh, forces, kind of in the middle. Hydrogen bonding will be the highest. Now, there is another force that we need to be aware of, and we're talking about ionic forces. Now, we've talked about ionic forces already back in, uh, back in, in, in Unit 2, but it's worth remembering that ionic forces are st very strong. So in this uh, description or the, this picture of magnesium dioxide, this cartoon here, we can see that these electrostatic forces, you know, the positives and the negatives, that's very strong. In fact, that's stronger than uh, LDF, that's stronger than dipole-dipole. It's even stronger than hydrogen bonding. So that's why we say ionic forces are the strongest of these four. And so ionic compounds are going to have the highest melting point, the highest boiling point of pretty much any of these other compounds, except for a certain exception that we'll talk about here in an upcoming video. So to review, like I said, ionic forces are the strongest. And if you're asked to, to rank those, use the same strategies that we learned back in Unit 2. Uh, think about the charge. You know, a plus 2 minus 2 is going to have a stronger attraction than a plus 1 minus 1. If it's a tie, then think about ionic size. Larger ions are more weakly attracted to each other than smaller ions. Uh, hydrogen bonds are the second strongest. And then it goes dipole-dipole after that. And then London dispersion forces are the weakest, generally speaking. Uh, and of course, if it's a tiebreaker, like we saw earlier, the one that's got more electrons is more polarizable and will have the stronger London dispersion forces. So let's try an example here. For each of the following compounds, let's state which type of intermolecular forces you would have. Now, just by default, I hope you always say London dispersion forces because everything has London dispersion forces. But this also has hydrogen as well as oxygen and that nitrogen in there. So it's pretty safe to say we're going to have hydrogen bonding as well. So that's, that's true. What about barium sulfate? By default, you want to say London dispersion force, right? But does it have anything else? Metal? Non-metal, right? Cation, anion. So it's all, it also has ionic forces. So London dispersion forces and ionic forces. What about methane? Well, that's a nonpolar molecule after we drew that so many times in, the, in Unit 2, right? So this is just London dispersion forces, nothing else, because it is a nonpolar structure. How about nitrogen trifluoride? Once again, by default, it always has London dispersion forces. But if you draw it out, you notice that it's going to have a polar structure. It has an unshared electron pair on top, a lone pair. So it's going to have dipole-dipole forces as well. So you can basically take a look at any structure and answer this question, answer which type of intermolecular forces are present. Now, we're going to look at these same four structures, these same four molecules, and now we're going to rank them in order of increasing boiling point. So 
which one is the lowest? Which one is the lowest on that hierarchy? Well, it's the one that's just London dispersion forces. So that's going to be the methane molecule. What's well, a little bit higher? Dipole, dipole. All right, so that's your nitrogen trifluoride. What's a little bit higher? That should be hydrogen bonding, right? So that's our HNO3. And what's the highest of them all? That would be ionic forces, so barium sulfate. And once again, you can look these up and confirm that that's, that, uh, that's the case. I hope you learned something about uh, intermolecular forces, how to rank them, how to determine the intermolecular forces that are present in substances. If you learned something, please smash that thumbs up button and leave a comment down below. It really does help the algorithm. I hope to see you on my channel in the next video, which is going to cover Unit 3, Section 2.